In this video, we're going to take a look at the ethics of abortion. This has become a very controversial issue and a big hot topic today, especially in the United States. For the purposes of this video and thinking about abortion, I want you to try to come at this with a blank slate. The reason is because many people find this issue to be extremely important and it can sort of place us in different camps or different tribes. And when we discuss issues that we sort of identify with, as sort of part of our tribe or part of our camp, it can start biasing our thinking. So for the purposes of this video and to try to be as objective as possible, try to come at this issue with a blank slate. So let's first, before we get into the ethics, let's take a look at some of the facts and some of the science of pregnancy and the stages of pregnancy. So there are basically three stages of pregnancy, the first, second, and third trimester. The first trimester um, happens when the egg is fertilized, forming a zygote. This, around after around five days, implants, forms an embryo. And then after around 56 days or so, it becomes a fetus, taking on a human shape. And it's about the size of a raspberry after eight weeks. Now, 90% of abortions happen uh, in this phase, in the first trimester. Uh, in the second trimester, 13 to 24 weeks, uh, the sex can be determined. Uh, quickening happens, which is when the mother can feel um, the unborn kick his or her feet. And viability happens, which is the ability to survive outside the womb. Um, now, viability is a very important time because According to law, which was established by Roe v. Wade, abortion is illegal after viability. Now, there are a couple of um, uh, phases during pregnancy that many people would consider morally relevant, so that are important for the moral debate. Um, implantation is a morally relevant phase, according to many people. Um, the point at which the fetus or the, the embryo takes the form of a person may also be a morally relevant uh, phase during the, this process. Whether or not the unborn can feel pain is also morally relevant. And according to the studies, uh, an unborn cannot feel pain prior to around uh, 24 weeks. There are a couple different studies on this, so it's around 24 weeks, um, which means that according to all these studies, uh, the fetus cannot feel pain in the, in the first trimester. So that's an important point regarding the morality. Uh, viability is also very important, as we said before. Now, I would say for our purposes in discussing this debate, let's just focus on whether or not abortion is permitted in, in the first trimester, since that's when most abortions actually occur. Okay, so here's uh, some visuals which many people consider morally important. Um, as you can see, around this time is when the fetus takes a more sort of human form. And some people have argued that this is the point at which the fetus becomes a person and has rights and so on. So what it looks like may be morally relevant, which is why I have this slide. Here are some just quick facts uh, on U.S. abortions. Half of all pregnancies are unintended. 21% of unintended pregnancies end in abortion. Uh, those don't include miscarriages. In 2011, one, about a million abortions were performed. That's a little bit less than the years prior. Uh, each year, 1.7% of women between 15 and 44 have an abortion. 37% of women having abortions say they are Protestant. 28% say they're Catholic. 51% of women who have abortions had used comp contraception during the month that they became pregnant. That's, that's pretty interesting. So about half of women who have abortions actually use contraception. The risk of death associated with abortion is one death per million abortions performed at eight weeks or earlier. Less than 0.5% of women having first trimester abortions suffer major complications. Um, so that's all to say, this is all to say that abortions are pretty safe at least if uh, performed in the first trimester. Uh, women in their 20s are responsible for over 50% of all abortions. Women, have it, women who have one or more children account for 61% of abortions. So here are some statistics regarding abortion and public opinion. 
Uh, first question, do you think abortion sh should be legal under any circumstances, legal only in certain circumstances, or legal in all circumstances? So 19% uh, says it should always be illegal, 51% says sometimes legal, 21% says it should be always illegal, or always legal. 50% uh, are pro-choice, 44% uh, are pro-life, so it's pretty much evenly split. Split. Do you personally believe that, in general, abortion is morally acceptable or morally wrong? Evenly split, split here. This raises a very important distinction, which is the morality of abortion versus the legality of abortion. Um, there is a difference between something, thinking that something should be illegal and thinking that something is morally wrong. Just because something is morally wrong does not mean it should be illegal. Just because something is illegal doesn't mean it's morally wrong. For example, um, it's morally wrong to cheat on your spouse, but it's not illegal. You're not going to go to jail for it or you're not going to get fined for it. It's illegal to run through a stop sign, but it's probably not morally wrong if there's nobody around. That might be debatable. Point being, there's a difference between the morality of something and the legality of something, although the morality can inform the legality of it. Okay, pro-choice, 31% are Republicans, 50% are independents, 68% of are Democrats. No surprise there. So a little bit about the history and religion of abortion, just to give it some historical context. Aristotle said, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. The Hippocratic Oath allowed the use of abortifacients. Hebrew and Christian scriptures do not denounce abortion and do not suggest that the fetus is a person. If you look at the scriptures, at least according to uh, Louis Vaughn, they do mention a few things about abortion. Um, I forget where, but I think they said something. It says something like um, it's permitted in the case of Christian ideas about the personhood of the feta have changed throughout the centuries. In the 12th century, the Catholic Church states that the embryo cannot have a soul until several weeks after conception, I think during quickening, but they changed their view in the 19th century saying that ensoulment occurs at conception. So the point being is that social views and religious views regarding abortion have changed quite a bit throughout history. Now on the literature regarding the ethics of abortion, they make a distinction between therapeutic and induced abortion. Therapeutic ab abortion happens when um, it is done in order to save the life of the mother or to prevent irreparable extreme harm to the mother. Induced abortion happens when uh, it's not needed to save the life of the mother. So most people think that therapeutic abortion is permissible. So we will most, we'll be talking about induced abortion. There are three basic views regarding abortion and you can, there are differences even within these views. But for the sake of uh, simplicity, we'll just look at these basic views. So there's a conservative, liberal, and moderate view. The conservative basically says abortion is never morally permissible. And again, there is some wiggle room even within conservative views um, about when abortion may or may not be permissible. For example, you can be conservative and say that therapeutic abortion is permissible. Um, so again, there are there is elbow room within these views. The liberal will say that abortion is permissible in any case. Again, kind of an oversimplified view. Moderate will say that abortion is sometimes permissible. Again, these uh, definitions here are a bit oversimplified and a bit extreme, but they are helpful for the sake of understanding the arguments, uh, the basic arguments, which then can become more complex. So we've got to start with the basics. Now, any view that you have, any view that people have, um, is going to have some common ground. So everyone agrees that unjustified killing is wrong. In other words, murder is wrong. Everybody's going to agree that people, persons, have a right to life, and everybody agrees that personal freedom should not be curtailed except for important reasons. So while there are many different views regarding abortion, um, there is some common ground. And the common ground is important because otherwise um, we're not really going to get anywhere in the debate. So here are some common reasons for having an abortion. I'm not going to read through them. Um, if you want, go ahead and pause the video so that you can take a look. A little bit about the legality of abortion in the United States. As of May 2019, 
Uh, Roe versus Wade established that no state can ban abortions performed before viability. Again, um, after viability, after the infant, after the unborn can survive outside the mother's womb, that's when it would be illegal. Um, and also note that uh, heartbeat starts before viability. So the rationale behind this ruling was that the right of, a, of personal privacy limits state interference in people's private life. So notice, interesting, this is interesting that the rationale didn't cite anything about personhood. It's about uh, privacy rights. So what that means is that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, that might have implications for privacy rights. Hmm. But this right to privacy is not absolute, just like any right is not absolute. There are uh, limits, constraints. Um, it must be balanced against state interests. So, if, for example, we all have a right to privacy, but if the state needs to audit our business, um, that might infringe upon the right a little bit, but it's warranted because it's in the interest of, of the state or everybody in the state. So Roe versus Wade leaves the state free to place increasing restrictions on abortion as the period of pregnancy uh, lengthens, uh, just so long as those restrictions are tailored to the to recognized interests of the state. Now we should also note that the law has never maintained that the unborn are people, at least not in the whole sense. And according to standard legal doctrine, at least today, before viability, abortion can be restricted in, in many ways as long as the constraints do not amount to an undue burden on a woman who's trying to get an abortion. Okay, so let's start with the conservative view, which says that abortion is never permissible. The basic idea here, according to this first uh, stab at an argument, is that it's, it's wrong to kill an innocent human. The unborn is a human, therefore it's wrong to kill the unborn. Right, this argument seems to work on the face of it, but if you look closely, uh, there's actually a, uh, a fallacy, a big a equivocation. The argument is problematic because it equivoc equivocates human being, the use of the word human being here, with a different sense of the human word human being in premise two. Um, in premise one, human being basically means a person endowed with rights, the right not to be killed arbitrarily or not to be killed without just cause. Um, the second use of the word human being in premise two speaks of human as in, in the strictly uh, biological sense. So the, this argument actually is using two different senses of the word human being. Um, here's another way, perhaps a simpler way of understanding the problem here. Two, the unborn is an innocent human being, therefore it's wrong to kill the unborn, is presupposing that the unborn is a person. In other words, an entity that has rights. And that is the whole arg that's the whole issue. Is the unborn a person with rights? And this um, this argument doesn't do anything to say yes or no or to support an answer to that question. So this argument begs the question as to why the unborn has equivalent moral status to people. Why should the unborn have the same moral status as um, an adult human being or an adult or a, a human child? Okay, so the conservatives can say no problem. We can sort of tinker with this argument just a little bit to make it work. So he, here's uh, the second take here. Um, first premise, the killing of an innocent person is wrong. The unborn is an innocent person from the moment of conception. Therefore, it is wrong to kill the unborn. Again, you can tinker with number two, depending on your view. But let's run with this. One is obviously true. It's wrong to kill an innocent person. The controversy happens with premise two. Is the unborn an innocent person from the moment of conception? An innocent person with the same rights as any other person, adult, child, whatever. Well, how would you support that premise? There are many different ways of doing it. A lot of the argument a lot of the debate comes down to this premise. Well, one way to s support the idea that um, the unborn from the moment of conception is a person is to say this. Well, from conception until birth, there is no principled way of identifying a, thre a threshold after which 
the unborn all of a sudden becomes a person. So there's no principled way of demarcating the formation of personhood. At what point does the fetus or the embryo become a person? Um, there is no point that we can identify um, or any point that we identify is going to be arbitrary so the unborn must be a person from conception. All right, so that's one way of supporting premise two. Now there are some objections to this reasoning. First objection is just because, now there are some objections to this reasoning. The first objection is that just because no non-person, person line can be drawn doesn't mean there's no moral difference or no difference between the two phenomena. For example, um, at what we can't pinpoint a point at which a tadpole becomes a frog. Um, nevertheless, there is a difference between a tadpole and a frog. Similarly, so the objection goes, there is no point at which we can say a embryo or a fetus becomes a person, but that doesn't mean there is no difference between a person and an embryo or a fetus. Another objection is that the zygote, so right after um, right after conception, um, cannot be an individual person. It cannot be an individual human being, and therefore it cannot be an individual person. And the reason is because it could divide into uh, twins. It could actually become two people. So since the zygote could become two people, it can't be an individual. Okay, so at this point, the conservative could say something like this. Well, maybe at the point of conception, um, the embryo is not a person, maybe the fetus isn't a person, but it is a potential person. So the unborn is a potential person. And that is what gives the unborn um, the same rights as a person. So they could say something like, it's wrong to kill an innocent potential person. Um, in other words, because potential people have rights. This unborn is an innocent potential person, therefore it's wrong to kill the unborn. Now, there may be problems with this. This is a, a, another pretty common argument. Uh, one potential problem is that having a trait that affords you a right and having the potential to develop that trait, which affords you that right, are morally distinct. You and I have the right to um, live the kind of life that we want. We can pursue whatever we really want to pursue. Now, we, we're free. We have the right to be free. Um, it is in virtue of a certain trait that we have that right. It's in virtue of us being rational, being autonomous, the ability to act on reasons that gives us that right. So we have this capacity that gives us this right to, to be free, to live the way we want to live. The unborn does not have that trait. Therefore, there's a difference between having that trait, which gives you the right, and not having that trait. Another potential problem is that if X, whatever it may be, is a potential person, then X has equal rights to actual people. So that's basically what this argument is saying. But there's problems with that. This can result in absurdities. So for example, with the appropriate technology, eventually your operating system could be a person, depending on how you want to define person. With the right technology, your pet cat could become a person. You could go into the pet cat, inject it with some drug, and it becomes super smart. You know, kind of like Planet of the Apes. So. If this sentence is true, if X is a potential person, then X has equal rights to actual people, then a lot of things could have the rights of actual people, your operating system and your cat, because theoretically, they could become a person. Okay, so on the same line of reasoning as this, the same line of reasoning used by this argument, now young children should have the right to, say, vote or bear arms, since they have the potential of reaching age 18. So the problem with this argument, according to this, is that it results in absurdities. A four-year-old has the potential to uh, have the right to vote, it has the potential of uh, thinking rationally, therefore it should have the same rights of, uh, as an adult. You know, but that's absurd. Okay, so the conservative could respond to this in a number of ways, I think. Um, they could appeal to this idea of rights and trust. So here's an example of rights and trust. We have a right to procreate, to have children. Um, now, children don't have this right because they can't procreate. But nevertheless, some people have argued that 
they have a right and trust to procreate, which means they should be um, raised in such a way that they will be able to procreate when they become an adult. Nothing should happen to them that would uh, prevent them from carrying out this right when they have the capacity to carry out this right. So the same line of reasoning could be applied to the unborn. The unborn may have a right and trust to live a life. And in order to respect that right and trust, they should not be killed. So there could be a, a response, a conservative response along these lines. Okay, so let's switch over to the liberal argument. Um, the, the liberal argument basically says, first, the unborn is not a person. Therefore, the unborn does not have a right to life, and therefore it follows, follows that abortion is permissible. The first premise is the controversial premise. How might we support that first premise? How might the liberals support the first premise? Well, they may say something like, merely being human, having human DNA, is not sufficient for personhood. A being may not have human DNA, but still be considered a person with rights. What this means is that being a membership of Homo sapiens species is not what makes you a person. What makes you a person is some set of capacities, like being rational, having autonomy, and so on. So what that means is that um, there could be non-Homo sapiens that we would want to give rights to. Now, there, none exist right now that we know of, but if we um, sort of resurrect a Neanderthal, we would probably want to get that Neanderthal would probably be considered a person with, with rights. Or if intelligent aliens come down, um, they may have the same capacities that we have that would give them rights. So merely being human is not what makes you a person, according to this view. Along the same lines, species membership, being a member of a species, is morally arbitrary. In other words, saying that something has rights because it belongs to some species, to a species, is to commit what some philosophers call speciesism, a kind of bias that we have in favor of our own species. So what this means is that some other set of traits needs to be present for a being to be considered a person. So again, the idea here is that being, merely being a member of a species is not what makes you a person with rights. Rather, it's some set of traits or characteristics that makes an entity or a being a person. So what might these traits be? So Marianne Warren listed a bunch of traits that might help constitute personhood. So five traits that are most central to personhood are, are these. Now, possessing all these traits is not necessary for, for personhood, but possessing none of these traits would disqualify something from being a person. So here are the five traits. Um, they're conscious and have the ability to feel pain. They have the capacity to reason. Uh, they can engage in self-motivated activity. Uh, they have the capacity com to communicate, and they have the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness. So having all these is not necessary for being a person, um, but if you have none of them, then it cannot be a person. Now there's gray areas in between. For example, uh, a fish is probably conscious and has the capacity to feel pain. Uh, so it has one of these traits, but I don't think we would consider a fish a person. Um, in any case, the unborn do not have any of these features, and this is the, the upshot. The unborn do not have any of these features, therefore they are not a person, and so they don't have a right to life. Now, is that true? What about one? That's debatable. So the unborn definitely, I wouldn't say, have any of these uh, traits. Um, I don't think the unborn at any stage has a self-concept or self-awareness, but there are there is a point at which the unborn can feel pain somewhere around the end of the second trimester. And is the unborn at any point conscious? Not sure. In any case, if this is correct, then there is, is at least some point during pregnancy at which it would be permissible for abortion, namely the point at which um, before the unborn does not have this trait. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so to sum up this liberal argument so far, 
what they're saying is that the unborn um, are not persons because they don't have any of these traits, right? So in order for a being to be a person and have rights, they have to have at least some one of these traits or more than one. Um, but there are problems with that. So here are three objections to that view. First objection, there are some severely cognitively impaired individuals that don't possess any of, the tr any of these traits, or maybe just one. A person in a coma in a persistent vegetative state has none of these traits. Um, some people with severe cognitive impairments may not have any of these traits. So by this line of reasoning, it's okay to kill them. But that's an absurd, repugnant conclusion. Therefore, this liberal conception of a person has problems because it results in absurd, repugnant conclusions. Now, the liberal may have a response. They could say, even if some cognitively impaired individuals don't qualify as persons, we may still have good reasons not to kill them. And these reasons may not apply to the unborn. Another reply is that the personhood status is most um, of most cognitively impaired people is unclear. Whether that's a good, re good response is up for debate, but we'll leave it at that. Second objection. Infants do not possess any of these traits. Therefore, according to that line of reasoning, it's okay to kill them. Again, the liberal conception of persons has repugnant implications. Um, now, we can question, is this first sentence actually right? Well, infants do possess this, but is that enough to make them people? Again, fish also possess this, but we wouldn't call them uh, persons. So you would need more than that trait for it, something to be considered a person, but an infant only possesses this trait, therefore it seems like it would be okay to kill an infant. And that's repugnant. Third objection, most liberals believe it's wrong to kill infants, but the liberal has a hard time explaining why it's permissible to kill a fetus just before birth, but not permissible to kill an infant. So this would be um, an extreme liberal position, which would say even in the third trimester, it's okay to have an abortion. Those who hold that view have a very hard time explaining why that's okay, but killing an infant is not okay. Again, that would be a, a very extreme liberal position. The liberal may have a few responses to this. They may say, while infants are not full-fledged persons, infanticide is rarely permissible because infants still have moral standing. This is because they are very close to persons. Um, for the same reason, it's wrong to kill, say, highly person-like creatures, like uh, an orangutan or a great ape or something like that. Think of any problems with this if you can. Uh, another response is that infanticide should be condemned for utilitarian reasons. Uh, Joel Feinberg says this, warmth and sympathy toward babies clearly has great, a great deal of social utility. Permitting infanticide would undermine this attitude, therefore it would be bad for society. Okay, so let's move on to the moderate view. So this is the view in between the conservative or the extreme conservative and the liberal or extreme liberal. Basic argument, the unborn achieve pers personhood at point X. It's wrong to kill an innocent person. After point X, it's wrong to have an abortion. Now the big question is, what is point X? As I've defined these views, the liberal, conservative, and moderate view, most people take some moderate view, um, and they differ depending on where they define point X. So at what point does the unborn attain the status of personhood and therefore has the same rights as any of us? So there are a few positions here. First position, a fetus achieves personhood somewhere between conception and birth. Well, where is that? Many different positions there. For example, many people would say 
uh, a fetus or the unborn achieves personhood at viability. That is, when it can survive outside the mother's womb. Others might say a fetus achieves personhood at the point when it can feel pain. If it can feel pain, then it has a right to not suffer because it can suffer. Others may say when the heart starts beating, that that's the point at which the fetus becomes a person with rights um, and so on. So there could be other points as well. Now notice, if you really try to think this through, it's actually very difficult to pinpoint some stage or moment at which the fetus becomes a person. Um, but that doesn't mean that this it will run into a dead end. Um, I think it is, it can be helpful to go this route. Now another position is that a fetus gradually achieves moral standing, um, approximating high moral status as it develops. So what this means is that um, at conception until birth, the more it develops, the higher the moral status it achieves. So that at the point right before birth, it has, it has full-fledged personhood and has the same rights as, a, as an adult. Um, in the first trimester, say, it may have some rights, it may have some moral status, but it's a lower moral status than an adult human being. So it may have the same moral status as, uh, I don't know, a dolphin or something. And um, it's up for debate what it is that makes it have a higher moral status versus a lower moral status. For example, maybe the more sophisticated its awareness, the higher moral status it has. The third uh, position is that the fetus is a person with a right to life. However, this right does not guarantee having either a right to be given the use of or a right to be allowed continued use of another's body. So this is a famous view developed by Judith Thompson in her piece, A Defense of Abortion. So here she's, she's assuming that the fetus is a person with a right to life. But nevertheless, she says that that does not entail that the fetus has a right to basically um, sort of use the woman's body in order to survive. The unborn's right to life, in this case, is not absolute. There are limits. All right, so that's the video on abortion. Hopefully it's, uh, it clarified some of the main arguments for and against and in between. I think there are two big issues when it comes to the debate about abortion. The first issue is the issue of personhood. At what point does the unborn become a person with full-fledged rights, if at all? And some would say there is no point. And how do we figure that, that point? Is it at viability? Is it when it can feel pain? Is it when the fetus can have a heartbeat? And so on. That's one big important issue in this debate. Another big important thing to keep in mind is that even if the unborn has a right to life, there are other considerations that matter. So the right to choice is also a consideration that morally matters here. And some people will say that right to choice may trump the right to uh, life that the fetus may have, assuming it has it. So again, the basic idea here is that um, there are many moral considerations that come into this issue in addition to the moral status of the unborn. There's also the moral status of um, the female, the, the woman, and there's also the overall consequences of making it illegal or legalizing it, the consequences on society. So there are a lot of moral considerations that come into play here, and we need to sort of open our minds and look at all of them when we investigate this issue. All right, thanks for watching.